Welcome everybody to the counter clipping show. This is episode number 59 and it is um, January 31st, 2022. A whole bunch of stuff uh, to talk about tonight. That was not actually coughing. That was me trying to, I got like a little froggy in, thing in my throat. I was trying to shake it loose right before the stream. That's so that's what that was. That wasn't that actual coughing, but thank you for your concern. You might notice <coughs> that the image looks a little different. That is the new webcam, which has just been set up as of today. And so far, everything works perfectly well. I um, do not uh, imagine I'll be done fooling with it anytime soon because it's got all kind of neat little features. It's got uh, built in. It's not really a green screen, It's like, but it's built-in background masking, which does not look great. Um, but believe it or not, I actually have a green screen. It's just that I've, I, I need a thing to hang it on that's not this shelf, because the shelf is too far behind me. So so that's a thing that's that we will be breaking out at some point, but the rack to hang it on is like 60 bucks. So the topic of the week looks like we're hitching a little bit. So one of the things that we did was we have a significantly higher bit rate tonight and we have a significantly higher um, frame rate tonight. So that's why if we might if we're hitching, then that's why. So if, if anybody on the viewing end is noticing garbage quality right now, please say something. So uh, it looks like the lighting, the 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 new webcam's ability to deal with actual light seems to make a big difference hardbacks uh the hardbacks those are the new traveler second edition um is what those are thank you john longshore for the statue so uh tonight's topic is dream war game projects and i mean projects that aren't real games right project that, projects that maybe got talked about but never got turned into real games or maybe never got talked about at all or maybe a favorite designer you know you really wanted to see john hill tackle some subject and um he never did so that's the kind of dream project we are talking about tonight god i hope not i do i do i actually keep this trimmed well enough so that i i have fairly serious neck beard so it's my goal to to minimize that thank god all right so before we get going any further i would like to say hello to mark flanagan bayonet brandt joe faust from sunny akron canton ish ohio carl crater for the war game boot camp vince ree rick cox todd walser wade moore terrence bonham matt taylor purple norseman jeff beeler david imperato dale brady daniel berger william bird jeff anderson if i didn't say you already richard de fortuna William Ahrens, Strelnikoff, Stigler is in the house, uh, Henry Sikursky, Alan Salazar, Bill Simone, Joe Okabayashi, one of these days I'll figure out how to pronounce that name, Joe Wood, Robert Moffat, Tim Zales, Lind Pratt, also from Central Ohio. We started to thaw today, by the way. Uh, Terrence Bonham, uh, Tom Borman, John Stanley, Brian Gash, Manders, Cataclysm Now, Brent McCabe, John Clark, I think I said you already, Jacob Guernsey, Charles Latora, Kyle Reese, Brian Gash, I think I said you already too, Greg Grant, Adam, Jeffrey Wesovich, uh, let's see, oh, and Carl, thank you very much, Carl. Um, yes, that is how that works. So, Super Chats are enabled, and we have, uh, you know, a little... I turn the the thing the dingus on that tells me when you do that. I'm going to end up moving that somewhere else where it's easier to read, but it's really a pain in the ass to configure that. Uh, Kilroy from Kilroy was here. Half-Assed Gaming, BC Games, Six Actual John Longshore, all in the house. So one of the things that the Super Chats does is it makes absolutely certain that I do not miss your comment because Lord knows how the people with 10,000 viewers manage to handle it. I assume they have a team of moderators directing questions to them behind the scenes. I don't have a team of moderators. It's just me. So I feel bad when some great question gets asked and I didn't see it because I was busy clipping counters or answering to something else or not stabbing myself. Um, not that new. I've, I've worn uh, this shirt before. I've got a couple of these shirts, though. 
So available in the Ardwolf Slayer merch store. So if you haven't heard, Super Chats are enabled, so you can push that button and help the channel out, which has happened a couple of times already. You can also help the channel out if you want by buying some of these fine Ardwolf Slayer t-shirts. And there's also coffee mugs, and they're supposed to be hoodies, but spring has let me down on the hoodies. Um, they are, I have an order in for one, and I still haven't gotten mine, and it's been a long time. Oberlin, Ohio, holy cow. So I am originally from Lorain County, so I know exactly where Oberlin, Ohio is. The, so, I mean, the, the, the display, I'm still streaming in 1080. If I try to stream in 4K, I'm, I'm positive it will cause the uh, stream to choke, which I don't want. So, um, but even so, the webcam is 4K, and then it's downscaled to fit in this screen, and then I crop it somewhat, and all that stuff. So, a, a bunch of adjustments are planned for that. And please feel free to hit the thumbs up. That would be most appreciated as well. I'm not sure what's going on here with this. Did these things all go up? They did. Anyway, all right. So, yeah, everything looks good. So... Yeah, if there's any hiccups, let me know, because I, like, doubled the bit rate, which is, you know, the upstream bandwidth that I am eating, but I am also at 60 FPS, which should uh, make it a lot better. Autofocus on this new webcam is a lot faster than on the old webcam. Uh, I am not tossing the old webcam. I am taking it on the road. So I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Monday, July 14th, there will be no show. Um, I will be moving that show to the previous day, which is Sunday night, um, February 13th. Um, so just be aware of that. And then the following week, we will be taking the show as scheduled at 8 p.m. on Monday on the road to sunny and probably not particularly nice Sandusky, Ohio for Winterfest. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. I don't know if I'm going to hang around in the in the hall. I will absolutely get harassed if I do. Um, so that that is a thing that might be happening. So somebody had, um, I, you know, the, the question was suggested by uh, John from Half Ass Gaming. So so bear that in mind. I want to credit John for that because I think it's a great topic. Um. But then I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I'm not sure I really have, like, a dream project. That, and I'm not sure I could say, eh, I'd kind of like to see Mark Simonich tackle Sicily. Sure. I mean, but th that's not... Le Holy cow. So, thank you so much. Um, webcam is... I'm really happy. I, I, so, I'm going to rewatch the broadcast, because I'm narcissistic, um, afterwards and see what it looks like. And I also want to check and see if I said anything that's friggin' stupid. So that's, you know, that's a thing I have to do. Um, so I apologize for the squeaking, by the way. I meant to oil this thing and I didn't get a chance to. And then by the time um, it was five minutes before the show and it was squeaking away, I was like, man, it's too late now. I don't want because you got to clean it. Um, I am probably not watching the Super Bowl. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I will. We'll see. Cincinnati, right? Not that I care too much, but certainly up here in central Ohio, people will go nuts. Um, so, good for the Bengals. Glad for the Bengals. So, Stellar Conquest. Thanks for stopping by. A favorite old Avalon Hill uh, science fiction game of mine. One of the, th the things that I don't like about the framing so far is you can see the microphone boom. Um, and I managed previously to have it just off camera, so I'm curious to know if the sound is a little different. So we are still clipping The Little Land, um, the CSS game from Adam Starkweather, and is this a Starkweather design? It is... Uh, yes, it is a Starkweather game and series design, and... Um, it's the only East Front game in the series until now, although that will almost certainly change. That's nice. Um, and we're drinking the Tem Nivulin double cask. So this is bottled at 40%. It's 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 quite inexpensive as single malts go, but it's and it's it's highly drinkable. Um, it's very easy to drink. I'll I'll be honest. There are some single malts that are in the lower price range. It's cheaper than this, actually, um, that are not very palatable. 
Um, just because it's single malt does not make it good, <laughs> right? There's a reason a lot of these single malts distilleries, or a lot of these distilleries, you never see their stuff as single malts because it's undrinkable trash, um, and it just go it just goes into blends, crappy blends. So, I am happy personally, however, to drink Dewar's um, or Famous Grouse or something like that. I'll just drink it on the rocks. So. So yeah, so the the CSS series last volume and the next volume is modern or alternate modern anyway. It's you know Cold War gone hot stuff, uh, but he's also working on something he calls advanced CSS, um, and I think he's going to tackle Anzio with that. Now topically, I'm super interested in Anzio, but he's also now this is just talk right now. We'll see what it looks like. Um, he's talking about putting the firepower values on the backs of the counters, which I think is a hard pass for me to be completely honest uh i i hate that uh there there are it depends on how the game works like mechanically like in pacific war the firepower values are on the backs of the ship counters but you're really not playing with the ship counters on the map right you got them in a task force display and then you just flip everything over when you go to fight with the ships so maybe this will work out like that i don't know but i am i i do not favor the idea of putting firepower factors on the backs of the counters um pelican india pale ale from stigma that sounds pretty good I, I do like ipas but i like british ipas better than i like american ipas so uh because they tend to be better balanced i tend to think american ipas and even pale ales are over hopped and I like hops, but I but I all if if there's a lot of hops, then I like a lot of um, I like a lot of malt to balance it out. So we do have news this week. Um, one is the pa the the sad passing of friend of the channel and friend to a lot of war game channels, Chris Ridley, who passed away in back in November. Nobody found out until somebody reached out somehow and his wife got a hold of it and, and she passed along the news. Um, I had corresponded with Chris. I know a lot of other folks had corresponded with Chris. So I'm very saddened to see, to hear that news, particularly now, you know, when we're, you know, there's a, a lot of, there seems to be a lot of that going around, right? You know, I can't speak for anybody else, but I, I feel like there's that a lot of that's going around. So the, um, other news, the better news, somebody passed along some decision games news, which is something about World at War, but I'm not really super duper caring about that. Thomas Bandy, his big project is getting a handle on BCS, which is great. Um, I really want to get, so uh, I think I have got like four get, get it to the table this year games this year. And one of which is BCS, one of which is GCACW. It's not like we didn't play it last year, but we didn't play as much as I wanted. Um, uh, Pacific War is another one on that list, and, and that's kind of slotted in after we finish the Europa thing, uh, which is probably going to be uh, March, is my guess, but I don't expect to actually get the thing until mid-February, probably. So it uh, um, that's a guess, of course. I haven't heard any, any actual news news on the GMT giant shipment um, front. But we do have multi-man publishing news. So we are going to pull that up. And, of course, I did not prep this in advance. So let's see what the mini cam looks like tonight. Yeah, you'll so you'll notice... The, f the framing on the mini cam when, when I'm down in the corner is like really restricted where, where it wasn't before. All right, so this is the 2022 best guess as to multi-man publishing what they're going to do this year. So before we get started, okay, for ASL, there's a lot of stuff for ASL. Yanks will be released. That's a new printing of Yanks. Hell's Corner. So this is the new historical thing that is in the new edition of Rising Sun, but wasn't in previous printings. Will be released as a standalone scenario and map pack. So that's great. Sword and Fire Manila will be released. That is a very big historical ASL module. 
2022 Winter Offensive bonus pack will be released, even though there was no 2022 Winter Offensive. Uh, the updated pocket rule book, which will include Errata and Chapter F. Chapter F is the Desert Rules, will be released as well as Pocket Chapter H and Pocket Charts. Now, they've been talking about Pocket Chapter H for a long time, and they've been talking about Pocket Charts for a little bit, too. Um, so we'll see exactly where that stuff goes. But like I said, this is their best guess. They're not... I don't, I don't think they're actually lying to us, even if they don't make the schedule. Um... That said, I feel like I'd be better uh, off investing in the electronic rule book, which is continuously updated rather than the pocket rule book, but that's just me. Um, the Normandy Historical ASL, that is St. Mary Glees, uh, that will go on pre order. There is a Hakapala reprint, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Please, anyone from Finland, feel free to correct me. Um, uh, we'll go on pre-order. Now, I kind of thought that thing would never get reprinted, but apparently I'm wrong, so that's cool. Um, it's kind of a core module now. Personally, I think the fins are badly designed and overpowered, but that's just me. Um, Marco Polo Bridge Historical ASL will go on pre-order, which they might do as a starter kit historical. Now, the way I read the exact way this is stated here, and I haven't asked because I didn't think about it until just now, it kind of implies that they might do it as both full ASL and starter kit ASL, which is interesting. Never done that before. ASL overlay bundle, they've been talking about that for a while, will go on pre-order. Uh, do I need that? I don't think so, but I don't know. Um, I have latest versions of all of the modules except for Doomed Battalions, so, <clears throat> oh, we're going to get to that, John Longshore. So, uh, Perfidious Albion, I, I'm not going to recommend an iPad because iPads are expensive. I'm going to say go to Costco or Sam's Club and buy a uh, Samsung tablet or whatever um, and use that. That's what I did, um, and I am very happy with my Samsung tablet. Now, it's the bigger one. It's not the, the small cheapy, but, which I think you want if you're reading PDFs. I think you want a bigger display. Um So we're gonna we're gonna get to some of this stuff. So if I'm behind on the chat, I, my apologies. My apologies. All right. So <coughs> ASL starter kit number two and number three will be reprinted. These things get printed. They they they're in the warehouse for a month and then they're gone again. I, it it might be more than a month, but it's not much more than a month, right? So I feel like um, they should be printing these in larger quantities at this point. Eric Court for BCS will be released. GCACW on to Richmond 2 will go on pre-order. And if it makes its number fast enough, it might even get released this year, but I'm thinking next year is probably more likely. Skirmisher issue number three. For those who remember, the Skirmisher was MMP's GCACW magazine. This is going to have a bunch of like uh, scenarios on the Stonewall Jackson's Way 2 maps, um, including Mine Run. Um, and a couple other ones that I don't remember. Uh, but it's not going to have Chancellorsville in it from what I'm hearing at the moment. GTS, uh, Race, for Bast Race for Bastone, will be released. That's probably coming pretty soon. Uh, GTS Devil's Cauldron reprint will be released. That is supposedly coming after Race to Bastone. The GTS magazine with included game on the battles in the SAR in, I presume that to be 1940, uh, will go on pre-order, and GTS Utah will go on pre-order. I've personally been waiting for Utah for a long time. That's a day one pre-order for me. International Game Series, Storm Over Jerusalem. That's Area Impulse, Battle for Jerusalem uh, in, you know, the Romans' time. Um, that will go on pre-order. Victory Awaits will be released. Warriors of God type game on the War of the Roses will go on pre-order. Don't really have an opinion or care much about that. On to Japan, the Pacific Campaign in World War II, using a system similar to Avenge Pearl Harbor, which I have and haven't played, uh, will go on pre-order. OCS Crimea will go on pre-order. So this answers our question about what the next OCS game to hit pre-order will be. It looks like it is going to be Crimea. You're going to do OCS Magazine. Hopefully this will just be special, op whatever the magazine is called, Operational Matters Number 2. Uh, we'll have the Luzon game in it. I've seen the Luzon game. One of our guys, it was in on the playtest. Um, it is very compact. It's on a smaller than full-sized map. Um, 
so it should be a pretty easy game to learn o the basics of OCS on. Uh, Periodicals, the next special ops with Blitzkrieg to Moscow 2 will be released. So Blitzkrieg to Moscow, I think, is a Japanese design. Um, and looks fairly interesting from, I mean, at a glance at the, you know, at the, 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 the map and pieces, cause I can't read Japanese. So your guess is as good as mine as to whether it will actually be awesome or not, but it does look nifty. So, so there's all that. Um, so that is the multi-man publishing news. And I renamed all the, uh, the stream scenes. So I got to figure out what I'm doing here. So yeah, a lot of good stuff there. Um, um, I'm on the hook for, you know, I will be on the hook for whatever new they do for, um, for ASL, whatever new they do, well, whatever they do for GCACW and OCS and BCS and whatever. So that's a, I'm spending a lot of money there, but probably most of it won't actually go exit my wallet this year. So a lot of good stuff there. So it is fucko has arrived late to the party. So, yeah, a lot of good stuff <clears throat> um, on that list. The Manila cover art has been shown off on the MMP website, so go look at that if you want. It is a good cover. Um, looks nice. I mean, I don't know that it's a... It, it doesn't stand out from other recent ASL product covers, let me put it that way, but that doesn't mean it's ugly. I do think it looks good. So... Um, so the next line of battle game has been in the works for a while, and it sounds like I'm not going to get to talk to Chip Farr, the developer, about it this year because he's not coming to Winterfest. Um, but uh, it's called No Turning Back, and it is on the Battle of the Wilderness. Um, the other thing is that just because it doesn't show up on this list does not mean it can't show up on pre-order. They just may not have had the visibility on it, um, you know, in their January meeting. So... So don't write that off quite yet. And I am uh, absolutely going to buy the line of battle, Battle of the Wilderness. I'm completely behind that effort. So, so there's all that. So, <clears throat> all right. Dream Project from Greg Grant. First of all, Greg, welcome back to the stream. Um, would be another uh, to continue GTS Greatest Day to continue the battles around Khan, including Epsom and Char Char and One Goodwood and all that stuff. Uh, that would be neat. Um, and I don't really. So I am not a big fan of like saying the a designer or developer saying, "Oh, we'll release these scenarios after the game comes out," because uh, I've seen that happen too many times where it just that you know filling in the blanks from a previous project gets pushed out of the itinerary um by current projects and that's an understandable phenomenon um and it this is not the only case i've seen it uh, but i would certainly be a, all, a big fan of of seeing that stuff in the greatest day which i think the greatest i think the system would do a pretty good job at something like goodwood for example so That's another thing. There is no chance I am going to get uh, I am going to get charged for all that shit uh, from MMP all at the same time, <laughs> like GGMT did. But GGMT released like eight things this month, right? Or you know, not, well, it's not quite February, but uh, sometime in February, hopefully that stuff will show up. Um, and you know, I just happened to have ordered all their, you know, the entire re February release schedule. So, so if the you said the fonts, which fonts are tiny? Which on on the stuff behind me or on the uh, web page that we were reading the MMP stuff on? Goodwood, well, Goodwood, you know, don't forget how that shook out, right? Is you got, uh, you got, you know, pre-sighted and dug in, 88s hitting the advancing British tank columns, British, you know, Commonwealth tank columns. So, um, I think it would be very interesting to see how GTS could handle that. But yeah, it would be, it would be a big armor battle. There wasn't that much German armor there, though. That's so the it's not it's not Kursk, right? Um, uh, 
Oh, sorry about that. I Normally I zoom into that and I just didn't do it this time. Certainly I do with uh, GMT. If you're watching this on your phone, then yeah, that's going to be way too tiny. So I apologize. I have to think about that. I didn't think of that. Um, I did read everything though, so there's that. All right. So there's more Soviets here, but I'm actually into Germans now. So we are, you know, in some capacity kind of getting to halfway through the, the, the clipping on this thing. Yeah, GMT hasn't shipped anything yet uh, that I am aware of. So, and my ear is to the ground on that. Uh, Alan Salazar would like to see Ted Racer take on Operational Stalingrad. I mean, that'd be interesting. I, I'd be interested in whatever Ted, you know, Ted wants to release. I'm cool with that. The French titles over my shoulder are the Library of Napoleonic Battles from OSG. They all have English titles too. But if you like shelve them in the normal way, then the French titles will be showing. I did order, I paid for it like two years ago, um, the Third World War redo from Compass. Very excited about that. I got two more coming. Um, two more of those Napoleonic games coming. Reprint of Four Lost Battles and the brand new Bonaparte in the Quadrilateral coming. I uh, think latest word on that smelling to me like March. Uh, but those are, those are uh, paid for as well. Case Blue is damned unlike you know that's a you know that is a, a dream game for a lot of people and I I appreciate that Dream Project and Grail game probably have some overlap for a lot of people in this particular case and you know for a lot of folks Case Blue is the is the Grail game but I doubt we'll see it reprinted in our lifetime I I agree with with that statement. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean we won't see, you know, parts of it appear somewhere else. So don't assume that we'll never see any sign of it. We just, I don't think we'll see it again in its current format. I think, realistically, I think OCS games probably need to top out nowadays at about four maps because otherwise they become prohibitively expensive. Even Crimea it was decided not to include that in a different project and to release it on its own in part because the uh, thing was going to just be too big and expensive otherwise. Jeff Beeler asks if he has the GDW Third World War, does he really need the Compass reprint? That's up to you. I'd need probably not. I do not expect major changes to occur. Um, what I do expect to see is a substantially better mix of markers gdw is actually pretty bad at markers going through the you know playing europa as we are right now between you know mark and port hits and mark and airfield hits and mark and supply points and stuff like that the markers really kind of suck so it will be a trivial task to and that they said that that was one of the things that they were going to do is to in, sort of uh improve the tactile functionality of the markers Vietnam 72. Yeah, so that's that's neat. I I I think a maybe dream project would be a a a, a substantial overhaul of Victory Games Vietnam. Such a project is probably in the works right now, but uh, it is not the GMT Vietnam reprint, which is pretty much a straight reprint. Um, the other thing that the uh, Compass reprint of Third World War will do is it will fill that hole in the map that's around Poland. Um, is that area likely to see action? Probably not, but... So, we, we, we did a lot of traffic on the video last week, um, and I'm, I'm curious to know what folks think of me covering more RPG stuff. I know there's folks who just don't tune in for that, um, but it sounds like there was there was a, based on the comments and based on the, the the analytics, it looks like there are a lot of people, more people than average, watched the show last week. So, 
I'd be curious to know what people think about that. Now, that is a thing that may end up getting broken out into the second stream whenever that second stream happens, which is truthfully looking like it's going to be after Winterfest at best. So, on the other hand, um, another thing that I picked up was a Wacom tablet. So, that is... Um, where'd I put it? drawing tablet with a stylus that you can draw on this and it shows up on the computer screen. It's like wizardry. Um, I did it for mapping um, and the tablet was not that expensive. They're not they're not that expensive. They, they were a lot less expensive than I expected them to be. So what I might end up doing is a stream of that actually. So Jeffrey Wesovich asks, how many M.E. Labats, Marshall Enterprises Labat? Uh, I mean, so I've looked at the bouts into game, okay? And it's it's a bad product, Frank. frankly. It was like, you know, hundreds of dollars. And it's big. It's got a lot of maps and a lot of pieces, but it's also riddled with problems. Clearly not playtested. Um, so... On the other hand, like the hardcore Labat guys seem to be comfortable with that because they were probably going to tinker with it anyway. So, Greg Grant's Clip of Kharkov Battles. I uh, have clipped my Kharkov Battles already. It was quite the wrist workout. Oh, there'll be more Traveler stuff. I, I was really trying to get a Traveler video done over the weekend, and it just did not come together. So, hopefully there'll be a Traveler Tuesday video tomorrow. If not, there might be a different RPG video coming later in the week. Um, I did like... I, I didn't even really know this until Dan said it on Dan's show. That, like, the week before this past week, I had 12 videos. <laughs> and, man, that's a lot. And and then looking at it, it's like, well, crap, that was a lot of work. Um, so I did... Um, at less this week, right? I didn't even have a regular unboxing this week, despite having a Hollow Legions ready to go. It's not ready to go. That's the problem. I have to edit it. Um, but I do have Hollow Legions unboxing filmed, um, and I've got the uh, two new third-party products sitting over there waiting to get filmed as well, which I'm going to try and get done in the next day or two. Um I have a bunch of stuff on pre-order from Mongoose. I will tell you, they're they're super responsive if there are problems. I pre-ordered, they, they put up for pre-order the Aliens of Charted Space, two volumes, and I ordered them both, and I got the PDFs right away, and then, you know, like nine months later or something like that, due to logistical delays, the volume two shows up, but then volume one never shows up. So it's like six months later and I emailed him. I said, Hey Matt, I never, you know, here's the order number. I never got the physical volume one. They shipped it right out. So, and it's behind, it's behind me. Damn it. <laughs> it's behind me on, on the shelf right now. So so we do have, and I, I'm still working on the shelves, right? Um, we do have a small number of RPGs behind me here so big section of traveler this is everything from uh mongoose traveler second edition that'll fit on the shelf um here we have a couple more of those and then we have some against the dark master which i've done a video on and some more traveler stuff and some stuff for mithras which is the non i i think of it anyway as the non glorantha version of RuneQuest. That's what I would use it for. Let me put it that way. Moffat Field says that his dream project is a miniatures-based Vietnam game. Uh, I believe I've seen that. Uh, isn't that out? Um, I saw it on a table at Compass Expo. I thought that was what I was looking at. Uh, Perfidious Albion asks, is there anything really new in Hollow Legions versus... So, okay. So... The new Hollow Legions has the Italian stuff and the desert stuff, um, plus updates of a lot of old scenarios that were either Italian scenarios or desert scenarios. And it has Soldiers of the Negus, which is 
not a full historical, but it's it's because it, you don't play it on a historical map. It's just on regular ASL maps, so it's really like a, a mini scenario pack. With but it's got its own counter mix. Uh, Ethiopians in uh, East Africa. Bill Broder says his dream project is Marie Herman's Empire of the Sun European Theater. Okay, so I'm a little confused <laughs> by a couple of things, but it's my understanding that Mark Herman is actually working on a Mediterranean adaptation of Empire of the Sun, which would, would be an insta-buy for, for me if uh, if it was to happen. Tom Borman asks if I ever played Pathfinder. Yeah, I still have... Um, Trying to think if I got rid of a bunch of Pathfinder. I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. Um, I did get rid of some stuff about two years ago. I took a box or two of stuff up to Half Price Books and just dumped it because I didn't want to deal with it. Um, and I'm trying to remember what that was. I want to say it was mostly Exalted um, rather than Pathfinder. I have played Pathfinder. I, I did an entire Origins where I did nothing but play Pathfinder all day, every day. And it was pretty good. <laughs> so, what what Mark's up to in his personal time is none of our business, damn it. So Salvastis Unconditional Surrender applied to World War One or even the Pacific. So World War One is happening... Um, the Pacific, Sal said he's working on as well, but I frankly believe that's going to be very challenging to adapt to that system. Uh, Daniel Berger says, interestingly, nobody said to Total War. I'm a, I'm a little surprised that nobody mentioned that. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for that. One, I think people are tired of talking about it. Secondly, um, and... Well, so... Another thing that I would like to do, and it's a matter of making the time to do it, is I, I can't do I can't do channel stuff every single night, man. Um, I've got two nights a week where we do war games. I'm willing to do, and I have one night a week where I do an RPG. Um, so something's got to give, and it's probably not going to be either of the war game nights. So if our RPG thing falls apart, which which won't happen, but I might drop out of it. Um, then I am very likely to pick that slack up on Sunday nights with something else, and that could be an RPG thing. So we'll see. Um, I have the second edition. I, I want. I mean, I don't have the world's biggest Pathfinder collection, but I had you know a, a couple of full adventure paths and a few scattered other adventure path modules, plus a few other modules, plus a lot of like the core first edition hardcovers. But I think not all of them. And I picked up the second edition core book, which I'm fine having, right? And and the difference between the two editions is not that big. Um, but then, you know, by, like by the time I bought the core book, there was like 15 books out. I'm like, man, part of the reason why I was getting I was getting a little sour on Pathfinder was the fact that you had all you had this huge quantity of supplements. Um, and honestly, if you're playing with like Pathfinder people, the expectation is that you are going to play with all of that stuff. And I am simply flatly unwilling to do that. So, uh, I am much more inclined to go another route than Pathfinder for my fantasy gaming needs. That's what's here. So, and, and another thing that is, uh, going to be purchased once I have... Um, <clears throat> the money to do it. <laughs> so, Doug Sentha says the difference between first, first and second edition Pathfinder is pretty major. I don't really think so. I mean, are there significant differences? Yes, but it's it's like it's it, it's a a little bit bigger of a shift than it was say D and D three to three point five. I'd I'd say, but it's not as big a shift as it was from. 3.5 to 4 or 4 to 5 or or 2 to 3. So that that's where I'm coming from when I put it that way. Bill Simone, now I haven't played Pathfinder 2. I played a fair amount of Pathfinder 1. I find that a very interesting statement that Bill just made. John, that's not all of them either, but uh don't forget Rachel Simmons. So 
Kyle Reese says he'd like to see more Iran Iraq war games. Yeah, uh, there's really not been very much traction on that, actually. So that is the death dealer, Frank Frazetta. Daniel Berger asks about Starfinder. And I'm gonna I'm gonna be super blunt about this, and it's gonna come off as really dismissive, and I'm okay with that. I don't like space DD. I don't like DD adapted to other genres. I think it works poorly. Um, I think space DD doesn't work any better than DD doing superheroes, which has been done. Or DD doing, you know, swa uh, swashbuckling, which has been done. Um, I don't like space DD. And Starfinder is space DD. Stars Without Number is space DD. I that doesn't mean there's nothing to like in those products. Stars Without Number in particular has some very interesting things in it. Um, but I'd never play, I'd never want to play it as a game because of that. So. Oh, she, she totally, yeah, she, uh, Jeff, she totally does. She posts like two videos a day. So, but she's just trying to get started. I've been doing this for a while. Um. So one of the things I, I signed up for vidIQ. Okay, reconnection successful. We may have hitched right there. So I I was not into spell spell jammer, but but spell jammer is space D and D, right? It embraces this is space D and D. So I don't have a real I don't have a like a problem with spell jammer in the same sense that I have saying okay this is D and D, but we're now going to treat it as though it were a generic science fiction system because it's not it it's it's not it doesn't highlight the right things, um, and I think that any effort to make it fit that space is. A, a doomed effort, despite other things that might be cool about it. Anyway, Philip Sobel, first of all, welcome to the stream. Don't forget to subscribe if you have not subscribed already. Is new to X Encounter War Games. What he is looking for is a good tactical Peninsular War game. So tactical, I'm going to recommend Operational Studies Group. Go to, I think it's napoleongames.com order they have two games on the peninsular war and there's another one coming eventually um one is napoleon invades spain which is the newer one and the other one is napoleon's quagmire this will give you something like eight to ten um tactical sort of grand tactical napoleonic battles and the system is very manageable Uh, Fucko says he just finished clipping last Blitzkrieg and he's now going to start Panzer's Last Stand. Don't forget to bring your clipper uh, on Thursday. Because we have to clip. Uh, yes, uh, my wife has her own channel. She is called... I'll, I'll post it in the chat. Because um, it's hard to spell. So yeah, if you wanna if you wanna help her out, go and subscribe. I just put it in the chat. Uh, she does. It's not a, a historical game or even a tabletop game channel. She does video games, and she does uh, survival and building type of games for the most part. Yes, absolutely. We are in fact going to clip the copy of Third Winter that we are playing as we play it. Brian Jarvis says Chinese New Year fireworks going off. Okay, is it? Yeah, I guess it is. How about that? I didn't even think of it. Ancient Conquest. Mr. Ghost Mr. Ghost Butter. I haven't seen the next the latest Ghostbusters, by the way. I keep hearing that it's good. So, I mean. Is the Library of Napoleonic Battles a true tactical experience? I'm not sure that it is. It's grand tactical, right? It's it's kind of brigade level. Um, so it's it's kind of sits at either at the very high end of tactical or at the very low end of operational. Given the amount of emphasis that is placed on supply in um, the Library of Napoleonic Battles, which is not that much... I tend to think it falls further into the tactical side 
But if you want to do tactical Napoleonics, like true tactical battalion level Napoleonics, then Labatai, the Labatai series, is your go-to thing. Um, it is very complicated. The games are very large and very expensive, and um, there are a number of different competing rule sets. So be prepared to kind of dig into a morass of, of uh, I mean, they're all really nice folks, um, and they'll help you out learning whatever it is, but, but then you're going to have a problem. So... There are counters in Triumph and Tragedy, as I recall. Um, not a lot, but there's some. I mean, if you don't if you don't clip Triumph and Tragedy, I don't know that that's a huge problem. But that is that is up to you and your conscience. Tim Zale says that modern tactical has been neglected. Most of the games stop in the '80s. Yeah, and there's a there's a just a ton of those. Perfidious Albion, yes, that is exactly the thing. The um, uh, Labat, the, the the units are battalions. In Library of Napoleonic Battles, the units are brigades. So now there's Labatai, uh, Quattro Batai in Espana, which is I think from Legion War games, which is four battles of the Peninsular War. But I have no experience with that system. Um, and the Eagles of France system has, no, which is the other well-regarded Napoleonic sort of grand tactical system, uh, has really not. Yeah, but on, uh, yeah. So, so John, that's that's the exact problem. Is is it's not called on battles anymore? Thank God, because because you literally cannot search for on battles. You will get garbage search results. Um, it will be coming out from lock and load, I think. And um, it has been given a much better name that you can actually search. But it does look interesting. It kind of looks like a super streamlined from the look of the counters, right? It's got very Labatt-esque looking counters. And Labatt's counters are gorgeous. Um, no question about that. They're also hard to read. Another example of a, a game, at least in some of those games, that puts info on, that you need on the back of the counter, which I am not a fan of. Jeff Beeler says, what would be a good war game system to depict the fighting on the Western Front as at a level below individual divisions? Showing the BEF's 100 Days campaign of 1918. Um, World War, well, so World War One's the tricky part that you're asking about. Um, most, I'm not aware of any, if say, say you want to do a regiment or brigade level game, um, the the red poppies games are but those are those are lower than that i think those are battalions or companies even um i think they're battalions i could be wrong about that um it's been a while since i've looked at my one red poppies game um let's see here go with this one next Peter Berg says land ships. That's actually an interesting, an interesting call. Yeah, board game bloke says red poppies is company level. That's what I thought. Lock and load is a weird choice of pub. I, you know, I I have a high opinion of lock and load as a publisher, um, and that is a thing that I might look at when they do publish it. But it is an oddball choice. It is it is outside of what they normally do. System 7 Napoleonics. Yeah, that's a callback, isn't it? I mean, if we're going to talk about tactical Napoleonics, I'm going to have Jim Ozarski on, and then we well, I, I can just shut up and leave, and I can let Jim talk the whole time. I think if I was going to do historical miniatures, and I'm not going to, um, I would I would want to do Napoleonics just because you you you're never going to run out of stuff to do, right? You're never going to run out of interesting different uniforms to paint. I'm Stigler. I'm satisfied. So that um, that instinct 
is exactly why I just said, screw it. I'm going with the Library of Napoleonic Battles. There are a couple alternatives. It's not like it's the clear, you know, king of the space like GB, uh, GCACW, where there's, it's hard to compete with that because it's that good. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of good um, tactical or grand tactical Napoleonic systems um, but none of them cover as many battles. Uh, well, okay, so there's Library of Napoleonic Battles, which does cover a lot of battles, and there's Jour de Gloire, which actually covers just as many battles. Um, but I've never played Jour de Gloire, so, so there's that. Tony from Tony's Board Life. Ugh, John. I, uh, well, hopefully that is an international problem. And not everybody. Let, let, let us know if you're having bad video. Let me hop back over to... Hop back over to that. Uh, you, you sh so it, it might not stream at higher than 720, but it, it should be. I'm, I'm trying to stream at 1080. If you're viewing on a phone, however, that could be a problem for a number of reasons. Phones don't downscale the streams well. At least not, not off of Twitch. I've got most of... Not, I don't have all of them, but I do have a lot of the Zucker operational games as well. And they've got some interesting things going for them. Uh, Stigler mentions Winter's Victory. So Winter's Victory is the upcoming game from New England Simulations on the Battle of Eilau, using an adaptation of the SPI Wellington's Victory series. That sounds super interesting, and I am going to investigate that when it comes out. In part because, you know, I could be interested in the topic, and in part because... Um, uh, New England Simulations has such a strong reputation. So, <laughs> Moffat Field says he's calling from his trash 80. Empire 5 minis rules. Now, I have it, I have it based on... Okay, so so we're clear about this. If, if a question is asked in my presence about Napoleonic miniatures, and Jim Ozarski answers that question... I'm just going to go with whatever Jim says. And Jim says Empire is not worth anybody's time. So I am going to have to defer to, to the expert on that matter. Uh, to the Greenfields Beyond and Home Before the Leaves Fall, I guess. There's also the, the Mike Resch operational series, but that only covers 1914, and it is pretty solidly divisional level. So, <clears throat> I got a picture or two of the ILA playtest game from um, Compass Expo as well. Uh, Profitus Albion mentions that Jour de Gloire, uh, which, which did originate in the Berg Triumph and Glory series from GMT, by the way. Eventually, that system got adapted into... I mean, I don't know if it's an, so much an adaptation or if it just was Berg's later thinking on, along similar lines, but that is the Glory system. It is, I, I'm wholly disinterested. I was going to ask a question about tactics. I'm not going to because I don't care. It's another, well, I don't want to talk about miniatures either, right? I, I'll, if, if I have a show about miniatures, which even though I'm not into miniatures, I might at some point have a show about miniatures. I'm going to actually have like miniatures people on. <laughs> and it not just not just going to be complaining about those damn miniatures people for two hours. Because that would be a crappy show. So... I want to say the the uh, the gamers SCS World War One games are also divisional level. I believe that to be the case. 
my wife might be streaming downstairs actually or, or recording and that might be that might be thrown off the bandwidth a little bit Matt Davidson suggests Age of Eagles. I do remember that Empire came in a big pretty box at one point. Alan Salazar asks about Napoleon's Triumph. I've never played it. I've seen it on a I've seen it set up at an Origins a few years ago, and it's it's very pretty and it's very highly regarded. So I will not get into miniatures. I, I guarantee that's not, not going to happen. Uh, because miniatures represents... Now, that's not to say I'm not going to ever get into some some level of modeling, right? I mean, the, the, the dice tower that I built a couple weeks ago was is, a, is an example of modeling. Um, and I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. If you're rolling half-inch dice, um, it turned out pretty well. And it is in a thematically appropriate Soviet color. I was going to put a big red... Hamel and sticker on the stickle on the back, and then I I, th I I thought twice about it. It seemed tasteless, so I thought I thought double of it. Highway to the Kremlin, like to play that, yeah. Uh, Risk Napoleon, yeah, that they did that, and and you know that's something that might tempt me actually if if I could get my hands on something like that, but I'm absolutely not willing to pay for what that high like highly collectible thing goes for. Okay, let's see here. I bought a whole bunch of stickers on Redbubble for things like... Okay, I don't know where they went. Different Soviet symbols and some Napoleonic stuff and some U.S. Army stuff and some, some, some stickers that seemed int of interest to war gamers and... Um, I'm probably not going to use any of them uh, on that dice tower, anyway. Now, I'd be curious to know that uh, how that Napoleon, the, the classic Columbia Games Napoleon, how that plays. Because that's something that I've been tempted by. Uh, Jeff Beeler, that would be cool. Um... Avalanche Press, have you seen the Avalanche Press uh, Imperium 3rd Millennium? Because it's it's not quite that good, but uh, but they tried. They tried to do it. Brent Elliott mentions DBA, which of course is you know a classic. If I think of Napoleonic miniatures, that's probably or is it DBN or I forget, but the Napoleonic version of that. Or maybe there isn't a Napoleonic version of that. I don't know what I'm talking about with miniatures, so. One of the things that was actually some development got done on it at one point was in was war in Europe except SCS. And apparently they, they did a draft. They got as far as a draft map. Um, and we've been in and out of the topic, Wade. Matt Taylor would like a good ACW naval game for ship-to-ship -ship combat. What about um, Ironsides? Is that what it's called? There is a game called Ironsides. Uh, there's a... Uh, what's the name of the GMT one? That was not that hard, hard to find. Um, I can picture the box. I can't, I can't picture the name of the game. Doug Sunseth uh, would like a strong tactical science fiction war game without giant stompy robots. What about... Oh, what was it called? Damn it. The other thing that FASA did. Not Battletech, but... Um, um, Renegade Legion. Terrence Bonham mentions Ironclads by Yaquinto. Iron and Oak is the GMT one. Yeah, okay, yeah. As soon as I thought of it, three people uh, popped it in the chat before I said anything. 
So, iron and oak. <laughs> there are some caveman RPGs, I can tell you that. But I'm unaware of a caveman war game. Clash of Arms does have a very detailed Age of Sail naval game. It is called Close Action. And I have played it. It is very good. It, it, it feels like Starfleet Battles for Age of Sail. If that terrifies you, um, then maybe that's a good instinct. Super Salad 64. Dream Project Eric Lee Smith's Civil War. That's coming from Compass. Um, it's... It's not like the next thing in the pipeline. The next thing in the Eric Lee Smith pipeline is Battle Him Volume 2. But after that, I think uh, Civil War is queued up. Jeff D. did Cave Master. I don't know that I remember that. <clears throat> I am, of course, familiar with Jeff um, from a variety of different places, actually. Uh, but, of course, uh, I very clearly remember his uh, old-school D&D art. Uh, but he's been involved in the hobby this whole time, so. Yield Geezer Gamer, Starship Troopers. That that does kind of... There they are in powered armor, though, so maybe that counts as giant stumpy robots. Close action is pretty complex. It, it is. I, I won't tell you it's not. It's more complex than wooden ships and iron men. One of the one of the I, I think an underrated designer Eric Lee Smith, um, hugely important and, inf and innovative designer, um, and it it you know that hasn't been fully appreciated until very recently. Yeah, so Jeff also did uh, his own Tecmo RPG. It's called Bethorm. I think I have a, I think I backed it on the Kickstarter, and I got a PDF version of it. Uh, but I haven't really looked closely at it because it's been so long since I've really contemplated doing anything with Tecmo stuff. At some point, there will be a video on Tecmo, however, from me. At some point. Modern World War III game at the strategic level. That would be interesting, actually. Um, I have heard nothing about that occurring, however. I mean, I guess you've got you know, more abstract things like supremacy, but that's that's not really a simulation, right? A good Tecmo... Doug mentions a Tecmo war game. Well, you know, part of the struggle with Tecmo is getting product out for many, many years, so... Uh, the, the Tecmo Foundation does appear to, you know, be releasing product periodically. A lot of it's new, uh, or, you know, new versions of older stuff. Uh, but, you know, you got to start somewhere. Uh, Jeff is doing good stuff for Bethorm, I can tell you that. I haven't looked at the Kurt Hills Atlas, though. I hear it's really good. I do have uh, the original Empire of the Petal Throne from TSR, which is, uh, you know, quite a collectible at this point. It's probably my rarest... So it's not my rarest piece, but it's my rarest RPG, I think. Um... I have a copy of Mitlin, the the which is the God's book for Tecmo. Um, I have the pre, the the spiral bound pre-publication version signed by M. A. R. Barker. That is my rarest thing. Jeff said that he was in on the playtest of Gurf's Traveler Interstellar Wars. He got a hardware person to design tanks for it by telling them they were fighters, which by that level of tech they would be due to grab. I guess that's true. Yeah, so the Starship Troop the, the new Starship Troopers is probably not not your thing if you're like a a, a board war gamer or a fan of the book. So the maps in that product were something else, right? For 1975, yeah, and you can get uh, you can get a great deal, if not all of the the, the worthwhile material on Drive Through RPG and PDF. And honestly, at this point, I, I've resolved that there is like very little that I'm going to buy RP in the RPG world. I'm going to. It's not like war games where I can't really deal with just having electronic copies, right? Um, RPGs I can deal with just having electronic copies for almost everything. 
the exception is Traveler. Um, there's also... Uh, Chris K., yeah, that is a, a, a statuette of Frank Frazetta's Death Dealer that John Longshore was kind enough to send my way. So thank you again, John. I did want to display it. Um, so we, we had to bump some some Compass Games product because of that. But we're clipping Compass Games, so, you know, it's like an ad for Compass Games. I don't know that Seal of the Imperium is available on Drive Through RPG, but the, but the important the important thing, which is, if you want rules, go ahead and get the, the classic game. Um, the important thing is the Tecmo source book, Swords and Glory Volume 1. That's like the core around which everything else revolves in Tecmo, as far as documentation goes. Um, and that you can get through Drive Through RPG. I don't know if you can get Swords and Glory Volume 2, uh, but I, I do have a Swords and Glory Volume 2. Oh, Aaron Somerville says they mixed up some tables in the print copy. That's disappointing. Uh, so there is, there have been two Dune RPGs. Um, and there are several movie tie-in board games. The best regarded of which is Dune Imperium, which I got for Christmas, actually. And which I have done nothing with other than take it apart and look at it. Um, and then there's the Dune... The classic Dune game from originally from Avalon Hill, um, and now available from Gale Force Nine, right? I think so. Um, and it's a very nice new version of that game, and it's a great game. Perfidious Albion. No, I have not tried the Death Ride series, but at some point we're going to do that. So it looks like an interesting series. Now, now, to what extent, you know, uh, so no, Dune is, none of those games are X-Base War games. Uh, the classic Dune game is a really good multiplayer uh, political game, uh, but it's not what I would call a war game, and it definitely does not have a hex map. So uh, I've heard really good things about Dune Imperium. I don't know why my dog is barking downstairs, by the way. Mark Herman's John Carter, Warlord of Mars. That would be a fascinating uh, thing to say. Hey, it's you know it's 1980. Let's get Mark Herman to do John Carter, whatever he wants as a John Carter game. Man, I I would I'd buy that regardless of what it turned out to look like. Just to just to turn him completely loose on on that property and see what he turned out. Chad Gennady mentions OCS Kursk. Yeah, so there is a Kursk OCS game that is in the works as well. And there's a Bagration game that is going to fit somewhere. I don't know where. Um, <clears throat> Swords and Sorcery. Yeah. Um... I, I I never owned Swords and Sorcery. Okay, so we're talking about the old Swords and Sorcery, I think. We're talking about the old Swords and Sorcery game from SPI. I never owned that, but I remember seeing it on the, on the shelf of the local bicycle store where I grew up. And, of all places. And it looked really interesting. It looked like a war game, role-playing game hybrid. Uh, I'm not sure how... Uh, John, I'm not sure how far they got on the Conan the Barbarian game. I know they, they said they were doing it, um, but I, I don't know how far along that was when SPI got bought or got taken over. Got taken over, and I wonder if, from a licensing standpoint, um, that didn't end up turning into the various uh, TSR Conan products, which were not great. I have a, I have a strong hunch I'd have loved that back in the day. I I also have a strong hunch that I if I if I obtained a copy now I'd probably be like this is kind of a turd. I don't know. So if Mark says he has the only copy, then okay, I'd be very curious to see what 
I mean, obviously that's going to be tied down with licensing problems, but uh, I'd be very curious to see what that looked like. I guess we're doing these next. Uh, David Harrison asked about Jack Rady's reprint of Course on Pocket, Course on Pocket 2. Um, I don't have any news on that. I don't know where that is. I know Jack's working on it. I, I um, you know, saw an interview with Jack mm, some time ago, not super recently, um, where he talked about it. And that is a very interesting looking project. I think it's expensive, but it is also a big, big, big game. So, John Sy says he'd like to see a reprint of Gulf Strike. I'd like to see, uh, so remember that when Gulf Strike was, you know, when they did Gulf Strike, it was hypothetical at the time, right? And it turned out that it, it mapped so closely onto what was going on when uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait that they actually, like, went out to the hobby stores and bought all the copies of Gulf Strike that they could find to take back to the Pentagon and, and game it out in a hurry. Um, that's kind of a classic, you know, war game story. But uh, I don't think I don't think I would favor a re just a straight reprint of Gulf Strike. Now, what I wouldn't mind seeing is like an Ira Iraq War and or Kuwait War game. But then you'd have to contend with the fact that that's a very unbalanced con uh, con conflict, um, and it would be challenging to design. So. Mike Anthony says Swords and Sorcery plays better if you use some of the variants where you have higher stacking. I have no opinion on that. Peter Bergs asks, are there any games about or related to the Malazan Empire? So that is the Steven Erickson and Ian Esselmont Malazan Empire series. Um, <clears throat> so I read the first four, and I bought the fifth one, and have stalled out on the fifth one about three times. Um, because it's another one of those. This is, it feels like a completely different novel, set with completely different people, and... None of the familiar characters are showing up, and now it's been years. Tim D6. First of all, Tim, thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Everybody, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Super Chats are on. Um, so check out the link, Tim, in the video description for uh, the Wargaming event calendar over at the Armchair Dragoons site. Um, it is your one-stop shop for seeing war game events. Now, that said, um, I will be attending Winterfest in Sandusky, Ohio in, I think, three weeks. Um, and Buckeye Game Fest in Columbus, Ohio in, I don't know, ten weeks or something like that. We will be going to Origins. Um, probably we would be going to WBC in some capacity. So so you're going to see coverage on that here. Um, <clears throat> the The... So Stigler says that the big ones are CSW Expo and the Board War Gaming Championship. So CSW Expo is is the Consim World Expo, and it's held in Tempe, Arizona, usually in July, but this year it's going to be in August due to whatever. Um, the Board War Gaming thing is um, so it's the it's the the World Board Gaming Championships, and it is not a war game specific event anymore, but there is still a lot of war gaming happening there. It is held in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, which is a lot closer to me than Tempe, Arizona. So, Amiibo Wars. Now, that said, CSW draws like 300 people, three or 400 people, maybe, where. Um, uh, WBC draws like 7,000. So WBC is a far larger event. Um, 
But what the wargaming population there looks like, I'm not sure about that. Oh, so Tim, you're in you're in you're in pretty good shape. Okay. So we've got Origins, we've got Buckeye Game Fest and Winterfest, which is uh at this point, if you're you're not in a game already, there's no more room at Winterfest. So uh, but Buckeye Game Fest, which is in April this year, which is um, we don't know if it's going to be the permanent new schedule slot for Buckeye Game Fest, but it might be. Um, and uh, there's going to be plenty of wargaming. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be, uh, <clears throat> I am helping to coordinate that. GCACW Vicksburg would be great. Yeah, well, that's probably coming at some point soonish. I mean, you know, it, it's... It's going to be one of the next two items after... Not, we're not counting the skirmisher in this. Uh, it's going to be one of the next two things, I think, after uh, On to Richmond 2. There's plenty of Bronze Age stuff floating around. I don't know about plenty, but some. A lot of it's not <clears throat> traditional Hex Encounter stuff, though. Good stuff. Good stuff. So. It's like our numbers are pretty good tonight. Um, GCACW Red River. That would be super interesting. Um, that would be very interesting, actually. Uh, and Taloma. The Taloma campaign, I think, would be a really interesting... Uh, I mean, I could talk about dream GCACW concepts all night. Um, <clears throat> Vicksburg's on the list. Um, the Valley campaigns are on the list. Not just Jackson's Valley campaign, but Sheridan's Valley campaign. Um... A lot has been covered already. A lot of the major stuff in the Eastern Theater has been covered already. Um, and a lot of the stuff that is not... Uh, some of the stuff that isn't treated yet and the stuff that is out of print super hard to get because it's in On to Richmond or Grand Takes Command is coming back in On to Richmond too. Um, but offhand, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of... Uh, the great majority of the Eastern Theater is on those maps already. So they could very easily say, and they, you know, they are. The, the skirmisher is going to leverage this. It's like, hey, we want to do mine run. Uh, GCACW Wilderness is in Grant Takes Command. That is the, the Overland campaign. So as far as I'm concerned, it, it replaces Lee versus Grant, which is kind of a proto uh, GCACW. So, I, I will also tell you that the villains at the Player's Aid will be uh, at Buckeye Game Fest as well. So, just so you're aware. Uh, and again, if you want to come to Buckeye Game Fest, let me know via email, ardwolfslayer at gmail.com, and we'll make sure you get into something. I do feel like not to not to 100% back Stigler on this, but I do feel like there's an awful lot of property. Now, SP, Decision doesn't own everything that SPI ever did, okay? Just so we're, we're straight on that. Some of that stuff got kept by TSR. All the fantasy stuff got kept by TSR. And, uh, yeah, so, John, uh, On to Richmond 2 will also contain Grant Takes Command 2, and a new module on the Petersburg campaign. I don't think I'm really bashing here because I've said in the past that I, you know, I I like some of the stuff the decision does, but I do think that that there, this huge catalog of classic SPI things is kind of wasted, just sitting there idle with decision. They are leveraging very little of it at any given time.
Mr. Ghost Butter, uh, baby wargamer, normally play grand strategy on PC. If you're doing, I mean, if you're doing like, uh, oh, uh, uh, Europa Universalis 4 or something like that, then none of those are more complicated than that. But I will tell you that Vietnam 65 to 75 is going to be a bear to get your head around uh, in, in, in the whole campaign. But it does have a lot of scenarios as well, so... Yeah, so a few, a few of the games got peeled off to Heritage. Some of them, I think, might have been those, are, are handled by Excalibur now. And then uh, a couple odds and ends ended up in various places. And then TSR hang, hung on to all the RPG stuff and the, uh, the fantasy sci-fi stuff. Or, well, maybe not the sci-fi stuff, because Decision was talking about doing a new edition of Outreach, and I think they're working on a new edition of Star, uh, Star Force, which sounds maybe interesting. I don't know. It's a complete design, ground-up redesign, and I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah, Jeff's right. It is it is Excalibur, not here. Her I don't think... When I think of Heritage, I think of Heritage Models, which is was dead even at the time, I think. Mo from Mo's Game Table is here. Thanks for stopping by. So, all right, let's... Uh, thank you, John, for taking care of that. I was working on that. I don't know what's up, what's what's up with that. I I would absolutely buy a new version of Outreach, um, and I wouldn't even mind if they enhanced it a bit. But if they completely redesigned it from the ground up, then then that's a different game, right? <laughs> um, and and I don't. I mean, Outreach was a unique game that really nobody else had ever had, to this day has really tried something with that level of scope, um, and. I would be interested to see. I would be interested to hear about somebody redoing it, but I'd also be very leery of if it's a complete redesign. I've got no desire to do that. I, I disagree with that, Doug. I think Outreach. Er, I, I think Outreach is great, but uh, I think Star Force is underappreciated. That doesn't, however, mean that Star Force was particularly fun to play. I'm not sure that it was, um, but. I think it's it's one of the rare examples of really thoroughly thought out uh, taking war game design uh, 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 paradigms and applying them to science fiction from first principles. That to me is why Star Force is interesting, not necessarily because it is a fantastic game in its own right. I do own uh, Star Force and Outreach again. Star Soldier, I didn't feel like I, I needed to grab. Brian Jarvis says, Is there a war game available based on The Expanse? No. There is, however, a board game based on The Expanse. It is designed by Jeff Engelstein. It has been described with, I think, some accuracy as a coin-like game. Um... I have also heard it described... I haven't played it, so this is secondhand. I have heard it described as very dry. So... Captain Asparagus. Fantastic name you have there. Welcome to the channel. I am pretty sure I have not seen Captain Asparagus before this evening. Now, John Longshore says, Come on, designer. Screw 50-year-old SPI games. Create something new. Um... Honestly, I think there's room for both. Um, I think there's room to keep old, old classic stuff in print, but I, I think there's. I don't know that. I think that's squeezing out much um, new stuff, to be honest. Chad Kennedy, OCS or BCS? Yes, that is in the that is in the works. Um, I have a meeting uh, next weekend, I think, about it. 
about exactly what we are planning. I would love to see a, a, an expanse. I mean, I think if we're going to see that, then I think what we're most most like more likely to see is a Starship Combat miniatures game, um, which I would probably. I mean, assuming it was like a Star Wars, you know, thing with pre-painted, pre-built miniatures. That that's something I might actually do. Modernize Magic Realm. Oh. I'll be honest, I, I don't think... So, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Magic Realm was a design effort by the late Richard Snyder. And it's a game that that a lot of people express positive opinions about now. And I am reasonably convinced that most of those people have never played it or tried to play it. Um... So I, I I would be happy to personally own a copy to paw through and give it a shot because I I've never owned Magic Realm but um, at the same time I think that is an example of a game that we probably don't need to see brought back. There's also a print and play version if you really you're really really that hot and bothered to get yourself a copy of Magic Realm there is a print and play version. However, having having experimented with the print and play concept i can tell you that you are probably better off i mean unless you just really want the project you're probably better off going out and paying 150 or 200 dollars for a copy of magic realm <laughs> you will probably eat more of your time if you pay your paid yourself by the hour um creating your print and play version than you would just going out to ebay and buying a 150 dollar copy of magic realm so Jim Ozarski, Realm Speak. I don't I haven't heard anything about that. That is interesting. Richard, oh, this, so that was a Richard Hamblin, not Richard Snyder. Snyder, Richard Snyder. That's plausible. I'm trying to remember what else Richard Snyder did, uh, but I got to go to RPG Geek for that because the the game that I know is a Richard Snyder game was Powers and Perils. Which I have, by the way, and which I will eventually do a video on. We're now doing research live online. Designers. Apparently not. Richard Hamblin. Um, Wordle time. <laughs> the um, I was doing the... Well, oh, William Aarons, thanks so much. Um, I was doing the Wordle thing. Uh, I'm not doing it, like, regularly, though. Um, so William says that he would like to see alt history games. George III comes to the colonies and challenges the Congress. That would be funny. Um, only if it's... Only if it's the George the Third from Hamilton, then then I would totally buy that. Uh, two, the Confederacy frees the slaves in 1862, after which France and the UK become allies of the CSA. Um, I think that is a super 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 unlikely historical notion. From from a like a okay, let's take this ridiculous premise and see where it goes. I could see that, but I think that is a very unlikely. Uh, I think very unlikely of, that either of those things are going to happen. Um, a number of reasons why um, the entire Confederate economy is based on slavery. Um, they they couldn't just dissolve slavery. I mean, there there have been no point to that, in, especially in 1862, when you consider that the reason why every Confederate state seceded was to preserve the institution of slavery. And we know this because they said that in their instruments of secession. So the other thing is the um the international situation now the the it's it's no secret that the british were a huge importer of southern cotton and the american blockade 
was harmful to the British economy. On the other hand, the British were afraid that if they supported the Confederacy, including even merely recognizing the Confederacy as a nation, that the North would simply invade Canada and cause them all kinds of problems. Um, so, and the British had other problems, you know, other global issues going on at the same time too. Um, the Britain and France were the two major world powers at the time, but Russia and Prussia and Austria were all pro and, and Japan were all pro union, you know, more so than they were pro Confederacy to the extent that Japan was even involved at the time. Um, so I, I don't think it's as simple as Confederacy outlaws, you know, gets rid of slavery and then the British and French are, are, are just cool with recognizing them. I don't think that necessarily works. Um, anyway. George the, Mo says George III challenges Washington to a duel. That might be awesome, actually. Or a musical duel, anyway. Um... Remember that the United States is not considered like a major global power at that time, right? So it's not like the British are like, oh, thank God, the Americans are off our back now, right? Um, but, you know, they were, they, they, they could get the cotton from, from the Ottomans when they did. And in fact, um, the Ottoman Empire was another pro-Union state because they were happy that there was the Confederacy, their major cotton competitor was getting blockaded. So... We are now talking about Wordle in the chat. I, I'm using the word tires to start with when I'm playing. I read a fairly convincing article that says the Russians will end up backing down over Ukraine. But I'm not going to try to summarize those arguments. Now, uh... The Confederates were kind of counting on some British support. And in fact, um, oh, somebody that was selling arms to both sides. It might have been the Prussians. I mean, th think about the quote from, which I'm not going to try to quote verbatim, the, the quote from Sherman at the beginning of the war. It said, you, you have no industry. Um, you're you are going to lose this war because you're you're mentally ready to fight it, but you physically do not have the stuff to fight it with. And he was right. So because the economy was essentially agrarian, and once you could no longer export the agrarian products, that was a huge problem. Jeff Beeler says a war game where the players are different groups of American First Nations from the Algonquin to the Incas with strengths and weaknesses and have to fight off waves of European invaders starting in 1492. Um, that could be interesting. I'll, I'll say that that'd be interesting. In fact, uh, that might be more interesting as a cooperative game where where the game itself plays the, plays the colonizers. That might make it um, an easier game to do. But I'm just, you know, I'm just talking, so... Holden Messerschmitt, Boss Tweed, and the Democrat Political Machine. I wonder... I, I don't know that that's much of a topic, but maybe. Jack might not be a neutral party. and I, I haven't read any of those. I'd be curious to see what Jack has to say about it, because he does know a lot about Russia. But I'm not... I, I'm unwilling to comment without having seen those articles. So, Gangs of New York, the board game, I think, was, is still something you could actually do. Street Fighter 2. So, that's like famous rap battles of history, the board game. We are done clipping. Uh, looks like I have... Well, about a sheet and a half left. So, we might still be clipping. Maybe I'll try and get this done and work the... Uh, work the squeak out of the clipper 
during the week. So at some point, now with my luck, this will all show up while I'm at Winterfest. But um, at some point, I'm going to have six games to clip from GMT. Um, several of which are huge. <laughs> so Vietnam's huge. Um, Barbarossa Army Group Center is just as huge. And Pacific War is huger. So that is... Um, going to be a project and which you might see me clipping those games till until mid-year then again we're going to get we're planning to get pacific war to the table so that might that might get clipped during the week so there is a game called tammany hall yeah and it, it's relatively well regarded uh, Doug says he'd really like to see a, an adaptation of Britannia for China. Well, lose on Facebook. Talk to him about it. Or start working on it and present him with a with a de facto thing. So Pacific War is not going to be the hugest game, but it's not the hugest game I've got, but it's going to be the hugest game I'm going to buy this year, probably. And Compass Games Third World War. God, how big is that going to be? I mean, it's going to be pretty big, I can tell you that. Okay, product information for Compass Games version of Third World War. Six maps, each measuring 22 by 34. Eight counter sheets of 916 inch counters. Standard rules, scenario and campaign booklet, numerous player aids, blah, 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 blah. Diplomacy cards for Persian Gulf. Um, so, not as big as... Pacific War counter-wise, but bigger map-wise. Uh, but Pacific War is only two maps, right? It's got a, a, a fair amount of display footprint. I've got some light machine oil to put in, put in it. It'll it'll worry. Yeah, it, 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 I imagine all those games are going to have the extra thick counters. And i got to tell you, if we get the miscut counter sheets again, I'm probably going to complain. Um, cause I've, I've dealt with enough of those now, um, in about three or four different GMT games over the last couple of years where one of the counter sheets in the game will have the first row of counters will be wider and the second row of counters will be column will be narrower. And that irritates me. SPQR was like that. Kilroy says China Middle Kingdom is a version of Britannia. No, I've never played Britannia. Oh, Justigard says, uh, first of all, Justigard, welcome. Welcome back. Um, the Italian campaign of Justinian and Belisarius using the Kingdom of Heaven system. That's super interesting idea. And actually, I do think that campaign of Italian reconquest would be a good game. Um... And there's not a lot of traffic on it. I mean, you get some in ca some of the battles you get in Cataphract, uh, but for the most part, we have not seen much on those games. Third World War will have a huge footprint. You can, if you subtract the maps from from Persian Gulf, you'd be surprised how much smaller it is, though. Because Persian Gulf kind of sits sits on the other maps at a weird angle. And takes up a lot of extra space. I don't know if it's a weird shape, Mo, as much as it is. These aren't friggin' square. And that irritates me. Speaking of Garibaldi, I did get to meet, um, what's his name, um, from Babylon 5 once. Um, he's much taller in person than he looked on the show. Jerry Doyle. So there is the Justinian module in Cataphract, which is, I'd say, a very superficial treatment of it. But uh, nevertheless, you can have some fun with it. I mean, they're not friggin' triangles, right? But they're also not square. And the problem is you'll end up with the, with the bigger counter on top of a smaller counter, and you go to pick them up, and you can't pick the stack up. 
That Doyle, yeah, a, a lot of those people from Babylon Five are dead. Mira Furlan's passed away. Andreas Kostoulis has passed away. Um, uh, Richard Biggs passed away. Jeff Conaway passed away. Uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of deceased people um, that were on Babylon Five. Yeah, John, that's that's the point with that. You just play Civ. You're, I'm good with that. I think I think I think the other actors that he was standing next to were also of similar height. That's a thing. He was probably six two, I'd say six two, six three. Stephen first. Stephen first was pretty unhealthy for a long time. Um, <clears throat> so there's that. When you think about, you know, how long the original Star Trek crew stayed around, and some of them are still alive, um, and they're all quite old now, that uh, you know, so many of those people from Babylon 5 are, are dead. Most of the original Battlestar Galactica... Yeah, but that was in the 70s. I mean, that's a long time ago. But Babylon 5 was in the 90s. Um, Dirk Benedict is still alive. Um, uh, June Lockhart is... Did I have the name right? That played Admiral Kane's daughter. Uh, she's still alive. Um... William Shatner's looking, I mean, he looks okay for 90 plus years old, is all I got to say. Kingdom of Heaven, Justin Gard says Kingdom of Heaven has a Mongol invasion scenario. That's interesting. I, I really got to look at my copy of Kingdom of Heaven because I, I, I really haven't done so. So I got, actually, I ordered like a five-pack of tweezers on um, Amazon. And these were the second biggest of the set. Are these the biggest? Yeah, these are the biggest ones. So I, I know some people have used monster-ass tweezers like this. But, I mean, I tried to use one of the medium sets, and it was super, super awkward. So I do not feel like I might use these on the barbecue grill or something like that. I do not feel they're super useful, and even these slightly smaller ones, not super useful. Um, one of the medium sets, I don't know where they went now. I don't know where they went now. Uh, but these these classic bent nose tweezers, and I got a set of three of these from Amazon not too long ago. Uh, these are these are the old standbys. These are really good. What I do find is a good idea is to take a pair of needle nose pliers and bend the tines in inward just a tiny bit, so that they will close like that, and that will help that you grab the bottom counter in the stack. Richard Hatch has passed away. That is that is correct. Walter Koenig is still alive. Um, and Michelle Nichols is apparently not in good health. But And, and George Takei is still alive. And George still... I, I think I'm thinking of Anne Lockhart, I think, is the actress I'm thinking of, actually. I've got a pair of the lighted ones, too. I have no idea what happened to them. I've got my, like, travel dice kit around here somewhere that, uh, uh, that, 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 that's where those might be. One cool feature that's built into the new webcam, by the way. Isn't that neat? So, George is pretty funny, too. So... Yeah, Vince is Ann Lockhart, not June Lockhart. Lockhart. Uh, that's plausible, yeah. And and well, Walter was really good on Babylon 5 as Bester, too. So. Yeah. 
So I think we're probably not getting that Traveler video filmed tonight. I could be wrong. We got about 15 more minutes. Let me pull my pull my outline up and see what I see what I haven't talked about. Okay, so we're still playing War in the Desert. The current turn I think is second turn July. I removed the LED too. I think if if I'm playing in a room where I need the tiny flashlight, then there's not enough light in the room and I'm going home. Um we are playing War in the Desert still on Wednesday nights, and it is now July, July 2, 1942, um, and we're still fighting over the Egyptian border, but we're at the point now where the uh, I, gotta, I got like a, a strike while the iron is hot, and I don't really have the supply. Um, we are still playing Blitzkrieg Legend. We're about a third of the way through it, and the French have started to have like serious line issues. Um. It's going to be a huge thing uh, uh, who wins initiative the next turn. If the Germans win initiative, then the French are kind of fucked. If the French win initiative, then they may be able to patch their line and slow things down again. That game is very sensitive to the to the outcome of initiative rolls. Um, and and a, a huge part of that is just the compressed time frame, right, of the, of the campaign. It's only like 12 or 14 turns or something like that so you really got to make stuff happen as the germans um we are setting up third winter so i anticipate that we will probably start playing that so what we'll do is we'll do like while one person's doing their turn on blitzkrieg legend the other people can be doing their turn on third winter and it hopefully will kind of work out um um when the the Wednesday stream, which is now the Tuesday stream, is scheduled, so remember that that's now on Tuesdays at seven thirty p.m. Eastern. That is here next uh, tomorrow, I should say. Um, I don't have a topic yet. We'll come up with a topic five minutes before the show. Um, still planning on getting the Thursday unboxing of Hollow Legions done. Plus, I'd like to get Prokhorovka done on Friday as well. I think the Friday unboxing for a while is going to be dedicated to the special bonus unboxing. It's going to be dedicated to ASL because i got a bunch of ASL material to get out. Sliders, I never really got into sliders. I thought it, it dropped hugely after the first episode, that, that, that pilot that they did, which was like, I think, an extra long movie. But the pilot was pretty awesome, okay? So they go to, like, the, the alternate reality where the communists uh, have taken over in the United States. And they, they, at one point, get captured by the local police, and they are brought before the People's Court and Commissar Wapner. And they actually got Judge Wapner with a nameplate that said Commissar Wapner. And they got Doug Llewellyn and everything. You have come to the People's Court, except it's the Communist People's Court. It was brilliant. Um, and that was it, the show was never that good. It was never did it reach that height. That, that first episode of Sliders was awesome. Tim Conway was, in fact, hilarious. Spies. Spies is supposed to be pretty good. I had it at one point. I had the TSR version, and which is identical to the SPI version. And I never got to play it, and I have no idea what happened to it. So, uh, industry is now starting to tell people, don't multitask at work. <laughs> Concentrate on what you're doing and do it right, and then move to the next thing. Don't multitask. That's that's how you, that's how mistakes get made, um, and that's absolutely right. Because there really is no such thing as multitasking. What you have instead is fast twit, fast switch tasking, um, and if you get mixed up, you're screwed. The standard for quality television has gone up considerably. There'll be a new season of Westworld on TV. Um, Sometime in 2022, I guess. The James Bond role-playing game was incredibly um, innovative. Um, I'm trying to remember who designed it. Um, and I don't remember. I'm, I'm looking it up. Jerry Klug designed uh, designed it. 
Systems Development by Greg Gordon and Neil Randall. Advice and game testing include Mark Herman, who you'd think it's since he was it was Victory Games, and Eric Lee Smith. So that's really interesting, actually. I'd be curious to... Th there were some really good supplements for that, too, actually. And it looks like Jerry Klug did a lot of the supplement design as well. I had the Q manual at one point. And that's a cool book. That's, you know, the book of all the, the goofy gadgets. No, uh... Perfidious Albion, it, it's a it's a great system, actually. Um, I, I think I think you look at that today and see, wow, this is a really clean playing system, uh, a forerunner of a lot of modern games. Um, I think it's actually a really great system. There's a big chat in the parallel chat happening about the Carol Burnett show, which which I agree was hilarious. But that's all I have to say. It was hilarious. Tim Conway was hilarious, but so was Carol Burnett. So. Yeah, that's a licensing problem. But you could take the system, redesign it, tack it onto something else. Um, and it was really good for what it was designed for, right? So. I haven't even been talking about comedy. But, you know, that's the joy of this experience, right? Is that we there are five conversations happening at the same time. Only one of which is the, th is the one that I am saying. Um, and other things are happening in the in the chat. So that's you know that's part of the the great thing about us all being here as kind of a community is that we can all interact with each other and we don't have to everybody could just listen to me and and have your own conversations in the chat. I'm completely okay with that. We do have a, uh, at some point in the not hugely distant future, there will be a Role Master video too. That is actually in the works. My favorite stand-up comic is probably, and I'm, I'm basing this on older work, um, I don't know what he's been up to lately, is probably Dara O'Brien, Irish comic. But very funny. You can see a bunch of him on YouTube. Eddie Murphy, when Eddie Murphy was 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 at his creative peak, he was pretty funny too. To be fair, Doug, that's exactly right. And 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 a lot of people do call it a podcast, and I think a lot of people listen to it as though it were a podcast. Like you know, whenever the next day or the, later in the week. Um, you know, whether cutting the grass or folding laundry or whatever. And I'm completely okay with that. There'll be, there'll be more hard stuff in the works too. I don't have anything immediately on the table. There is a character generation video that is partly scripted that I didn't get any farther with. Uh, right now is, you know, time is a, is a factor. So. But we will absolutely get back to Harn. So Harn kind of forms part of that core the, the core is basically the stuff that's behind me on the shelf. The Traveler, the Rune Quest, Call of Cthulhu as well. But I'm kind of done buying Call of Cthulhu stuff. Um, I don't need more Call of I've got enough Call of Cthulhu material to last forever. Um, uh, yeah, so a lot, I, I have relatively... I wish I'd have kept mine. Um, I reacquired some of them. Um, I do have some of the Merc books... I don't have that many of them. Um, against the... So... So what this is kind of... It's a it's a sort of... It's not really a retro clone. It's kind of its own thing. But if you, if you think of it as starting with... It's a, it's a Role Master retro clone. You, you, you would get a sense of what this thing does. It's a really neat product. I'd like to do some more video on this as well. And this is one of the things that I'd actually like to run... So, Against the Dark Master from an Italian publisher. Craig Ferguson was probably pretty funny as well. Oh, yeah, and uh, Howard Hessman just passed. Speaking of, uh, uh, somebody must have mentioned this in the chat because there was we were talking about uh, uh, WKRP in Cincinnati. Howard Hessman, uh, the great Dr. Johnny Fever, uh, just passed away. In his 80s. 
Harn is a campaign setting for RPGs, yes. And I've done quite a bit of video on Harn, so go back and check that out if you're that interested. I'm going to probably swim against the tide here and say that I didn't think that Andy Kaufman was funny at all. Um, you know, humor is subjective. That's all I can say. I didn't think he was funny. Dr. Johnny Fever, on the other hand, was funny. So... So I have a lot of Rollmaster in hard copy. What I don't have are the current Rollmaster Classic volumes, which are basically Rollmaster reformatted. Rollmaster 2nd Edition, you'd need to reformat because the old books are pretty ugly. Um, and that's kind of, if I was to run Rollmaster again, which seems really unlikely, that's kind of what I would where I would go, would be Rollmaster Classic. It's going to be much cleaner. But Iron Crown, the reconstituted Iron Crown, I can't even really call them that anymore because they got reconstituted like 20 years ago now, um, uh, is working on releasing a new version of Rollmaster this year. So we'll see, And it's called Rollmaster Unified or Rollmaster United. We'll see if it happens. The late, great Robin Williams. Lord John Warfin's uh, motivational speeches. Yes, that's true. Yeah, some of them. There is a battle game for Harness. It's called Battle Lust, um, and it is a miniatures rule set. I do have it. Um, I've never played it. It actually looks pretty good. Polly Shore. Speaking of unfunny, no thanks. I, I will stand up for WKRP. I'm not a big fan of Cincinnati, but I will stand up for WKRP in Cincinnati, which was a pretty funny show. Howie Mandel has been funny. He's one of those intermittently funny people. Uh, George Carlin was, was, was funny for a long time. Really funny for a long time. There is literally no good Polly Shore movie. I got, I got to tell you that, Mike. There is nothing like a quality Polly Shore movie. David Imperato is just being provocative now. Carrot Top is all roided out and all coked out. He'll, he'll fucking crush you if you run into Carrot Top now. He had to, he had to do that because people were probably punching him in the face all the time. Rodney Dangerhood was consistently funny too, but Rodney kind of had a shtick and, and he stuck with the shtick, which was effective. Brian Mobile, thanks for stopping by. I'll accept that characterization of Andy Kaufman. That Thanksgiving episode with the turkeys, that is that I mean you can go watch that on YouTube. That is legitimately still hilarious. I mean, as far as comedy goes, I was much I was more of a more of a Monty Python comedy than than a um, you know random American sitcom comedy. So, all right. So, what do we got happening? We'll see what happens later this week as far as later videos go, but we're definitely going to stream tomorrow night here on some random wargaming topic for five minutes and then rant madly for another 55 minutes on some random topic. Um, it, that will be tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I feel like Steve Martin, was her his early work was, was incredibly not funny, <laughs> actually. And as a straight man... As do, running do straight man comedy, he is almost on, he, almost without peer. I didn't think Norm Macdonald was funny either, to be honest. Not not once can I think of a funny thing that Norm Macdonald ever said. Um. So. Anyway, so I'd like to thank everybody for stopping by. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. Almost everybody that's coming every week is subscribed to the channel. Our top of the top of the charts here, I think, was at 129. Well, 130. Yeah, it looks like it's 130. 
So that's a pretty good night for a random night. The, the topic was going to be pet peeves of wargaming, and I changed it like five minutes after I posted the, the thing. And I'm like, man, that's gonna sound, that sounds like it's going to be a bitch fest, and I don't want to do that. So we're not going to probably... We, we might revisit that idea. Maybe I'll reframe that idea to be less negative um, and revisit it. But right now, we've got two more weeks, one of which is next week will be um, Monster Wargaming Conventions, the next week will be the live from Winterfest convention. And then the week after, I have no idea what we're doing. So so bear that in mind. And remember that the show on the 14th is actually going to be on the 13th. So same time, it's just going to be on Sunday night instead of Monday night. So everybody have a... I'm super gravelly, man. I This because I, I had like this frog in my throat early, earlier and it, it never quite shook loose. So I would like to thank everybody for stopping by. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for uh, for helping to support the channel. If you'd like to, you know, sign up to be a patron, please go check out the links in the video description. Also, merch store. Very happy with the shirts. I will have. A, I only have enough shirts to sell at Winterfest for people who have already asked for them. So I apologize for that. But the only other person who I know is going already has Ardwolf's Lair t-shirts. So 